Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. The link between sex, creativity, and the sense of aliveness is strong. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution? Or perhaps for emotional healing? Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on the Eros Evolution Show here on Ohm Times Radio and TV. Hello, hello, and welcome to Eros Evolution. I'm with Felix Chong. He is a very famous multi book author, very famous in Singapore. He doesn't Not just, so famous. Uh, write books, 22 books. Okay, how many times can one give birth? <laughs> 22 books and um, also teaches English uh, writing, right? Okay, so I'm going to uh, read, read his proper uh, profile. So I'm, anyway, I'm so happy you're here, Felix. Okay, so Felix Cheong is the author of 22 books across uh, different gen genres from poetry to graphic novels, from short stories to nonfiction. His latest book is uh, a young adult, a graphic novel, Eve and the Lost Ghost Family, recipient of the Young Artist Award in 2000 and 2000, 200,000. Uh, Felix has been invited to Writers Festival all over the world from Edinburgh to Sydney. He holds a master's in creative writing and is currently a Jungle University lecturer. You can find him on Facebook at Felix Cheong Author. And of course, you also have a website, uh, Felix, right? Mm -hmm. That's Cheong.net. Uh, Cheong as in C H E O N G. Thank you. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, so today's show title is Lady, I'll Touch You with My Mind. As a Hollywood rom com has it, writing love poetry to your beloved is an aphrodisiac. Uh, no, uh, not in Felix Chong's experience. So, the award winning writer of 22 books has penned dozens of love poems to friends and wives yes plural so not just his wives his wife <laughs> but uh, wives of other people i'm sure so a few poems were even featured in the poetry 2004 a kelly movie starring janice cole and keegan uh, kang but none of them has managed to woo or win a woman so in today's episode uh, felix will take a step at hollywood stereotypes about writers also will open up about his afternoon trips to a strip club in brisbane which has raised his writing only the writing nothing else to a new height so welcome felix thank you very much once again <laughs> thank you so uh so tell us about um being an author for uh you know of so many books um can you really make a living no you can't you can't really make a living from writing alone which is why i kind of promiscuously go to different universities to teach because as um not sure whether many of you know this but the royalty from a book is really only 10 to 12 percent per book that has been sold so that's like if this book sells for 20 dollars in the bookshop i get about two dollars so that's not even enough to buy you a plate of chicken rice so i have to make a living somehow and i do it best through teaching so you have find you, that a lot you, of have you thought of self-publishing uh yes but um the self-publishing scene is also quite limited because first you have to uh, set up the infrastructure of um, going to the bookshops you know getting them to take on your books put them on the shelf then you have to do your own publicity um it's just too much work yeah it's so a lot rather, of work mm, yes it is yeah considering the fact that you are also teaching so yep. it's best to just focus your energy on what you do best which is writing yes writing and yeah. then of course um i try to do my writing in between my classes and between semesters where whenever i can find pockets of time to while away and you know daydream brainstorm my map or just sit down at a coffee shop and start writing yeah that's awesome uh it takes a lot of self-discipline i'm sure a lot of writers have all kinds of questions uh for you around writing and your process and how to overcome writer's block so i know like your first book was 24 years ago and uh two years later you got the um, national arts council young artist award for literature uh so that's 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 awesome and 
you know, in these 24 years since your first book, you have 22 books. So that's almost one baby every year. Yes, which is tough, trying to deliver one baby every year. It, oh, that's why I get a little bit flabby. <laughs> flabby. Many books. Flabby, like I'm around the waist. Around. Sitting yeah. around. In fact, I once did an interview with a writer, um, an American writer called Jake, Jake Neham. He said that to become a good writer, you need an iron butt. Meaning you really need to plant yourself at a, on a chair, at a table, and pull out those words. One okay, word, pull another. Iron butt. Yes, iron butt. And also, so, um, yeah. yes, not only that, the the when i wrote my uh, second book i felt like i was uh bleeding through my fingers i i felt <laughs> i was really like i was having burning pains i felt i was vomiting onto the keyboard do you have these kinds of sensations well i try not to i just walk away from the manuscript for a week two weeks a month so sometimes it helps to put just put some distance between yourself and your writing so you learn to have a perspective on it to see for what it is, the flaws, the weaknesses, the strengths, then you can then be in a better place to uh, realign the manuscript, rewrite it, reshape it. Otherwise, when you're too close to the flame, sometimes you, you get burned. And I think that's how writer's block comes about. Basically, writer's block comes about because either you are not sure what you want to write about, so your, your head is stuck. I'm not sure what you want to write about. You may want to do, write about something, but you don't know how to put it across. Or you have not done enough research. You don't know enough about the material, the subject matter, the topic, or the characters, so that it doesn't come out, it just gets stuck. Mm. I love what you said about uh, having some distance, being too close to your material and also needing to take some space from it. I think these are some really very useful tips for anybody who's aspiring to be a writer. What, what would you say about those people who say, oh, I'm not creative enough. I just don't, don't have what it takes. It's just never any good. Well, creativity isn't just something that um, is a purview of you know, the very talented or the very gifted people. So that's a common misconception that Hollywood films have uh, perpetuated. Mm. So when we, whenever you watch a film about writers, you know, they're always bleeding, like you say, over the keyboard or a typewriter. And inevitably it has to be a typewriter, right? Because it, it's very old school and it makes a lot of sound. And so cinematically it looks great on screen. Mm. But that's a common misconception that you have to be gifted. You have to be creative. I think all of us are creative in some form or another. Every time you find a novel solution to a problem, you are kind of getting around or um, thinking out of the box. And you are finding a way to overcome, resolve a problem. So I think creativity in writing works the same way, although the tools are words. So you just have to think of, uh, say, a novel situation or vary a pattern. So writing, for example, a novel is also about knowing patterns, understanding the genre conventions, and being able to subvert, change, vary the pattern. So just take an example like the Twilight series. You remember the Twilight series? Yes. It was quite bad, right? <laughs> what? I love them. Well, it's kind of very sentimental, very lovey-dovey. But oh, essentially what... I what like. Yeah, well, it is what they call chick lit. A lot of women tend to go for this genre. So the writer Stephanie Mai didn't really do anything new with it. All she did was took um, a high school romance and then kind of fuse it with the horror genre. So you get vampires, you get werewolves, you get yes. uh, the young dead. And basically it's... it's in that fabric of weaving these two different genres that you get something apparently new, but it's not. So th there is the, the research that has to go into understanding a particular genre before you dive into it. So creativity, I would suggest, is not something 
that's only for the gifted. Mm. Got it. It's not for the gifted. Uh, yeah, you can do it. So, Anybody can do it. Oh, that's, it takes that's very practice. encouraging. Yes. It takes practice so, and, and discipline. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for that. So, um, so we're talking about writing, but I want to also know, like, you know, you are known for um, being a poet. And um, do you do you agree that uh, writing poetry to your beloved is an aphrodisiac? You help people to do it. So does that take away the romance? Um, I suppose writing love poetry is um, kind of starting point. So it's like turning the ignition key to start the engine. But whether the car travels far enough, huh? Let, let's let's wait and see. Whether it's a good car, it's a vintage car, whether it's a sports car. Yeah. So turning the ignition key is only step one. You still have to press on the accelerator. You need to keep your hands steady on the steering wheel. So for example, I think I if I remember, I wrote my first love poem back when I was in junior college. I had a big crush on my classmate. This girl called Veronica. <laughs> who okay, shall not be named. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. She wouldn't know. She wouldn't know. Anyway, I don't think she's tuning into this show. So um, I started writing a love poem for her. And I thought that can woo her because at the point I was quite an introvert and I didn't know how to reach out to girls. I had been studying in an all boys school for much of my life. So suddenly, when I was thrust into a junior college, in its it's boys, girls everywhere. I I couldn't fit in. I was an outsider. I was an oddball. And I knew this girl and had a crush on her. Thought I could kind of get into her heart by writing a love poem. So I wrote it. It was quite a bad love poem written in this very old-fashioned arcade language. I gave it to her. I wrote it on a card, you know. A self-made card, okay. I wrote it and gave it to her with one stalk of rose. So romantic, right? I thought that would turn her head and turn her heart towards me. But no. She just said, mm, thank you very much. And that's it. That's it. No romance bloom. So I figured over the years that poetry, according to the English poet W.H. Auden, Poetry makes nothing happen. So nothing happens. So it does, um, in some way, after you have established some kind of chemistry with the other person, it does in some way woo the person, but not really as an aphrodisiac as um, Hollywood films tend to portray it to be. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, so you had your first, first, crash and also all this illusion bubble burst uh, back when you were in JC and uh, and yet you persisted right you 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 started writing poetry you got your first book published so what what made you continue I think that first experience and brush with poetry was good because um, it started opening up my mind to possibilities of the written word and I've been I've always been an avid reader and kind of fancy myself as a writer. So I started writing more and more when I got into the university in NUS and because I was also studying literature. So that um, exposure to different kinds of writers from America, from the UK, um, started influencing me in how I use language. I, and I wrote uh, more poems, first imitating the writers that I love, the poets I love. And then o over time, started developing my own style, my own voice. So any writer um, always starts with imitation. Mimicry, I think, is the best form of flattery. You, you want to sound like the person you love reading about or reading. So you start imitating the style. Just like, you know, a child would imitate the language of his or her parents as a way to pick up the language. And over time, the child develops her voice. Same here. I need to, of course, write a lot of stuff. As they say, purge the garbage out of your system. All the angst, you know, teenage angst, all the 
bad metaphors, bad writing, get it out of the way. And then your own voice, if you are meant to be a writer, your own voice will come through. But that takes quite a lot of discipline, a lot of drafting, redrafting, chipping away at the stone until you know, it becomes a work of art. Yeah, agree. It's uh, it's really uh, not not a big market in Singapore, so I really get all the the difficulties and uh, your passion and dedication to your craft, finding your own voice. So uh, just now we started to talk about um, how your first poem, your first love poem, didn't really work in winning over your crush. So why do you think people still have this notion that uh, poetry or love poetry is an aphrodisiac? I think because it's very romantic. Mm. It's, it's, it's romantic, it's um, a way of externalizing what basically cannot be externalized. Mm -hmm. So you tend to think that, oh, if I put words on the page, that can move people. Yes, they can to some extent, but not all the way. It's like, yeah, I, you know. It depends on your audience also. Yes, it depends on whether the other person is receptive in the first place. So if you're talking to a wall, it doesn't matter how beautiful your words are, the wall is still solid, still blocks you. That's right. So what, what would you say uh, makes a solid love poem? What makes a solid love poem? I guess it's um, honesty, which is very hard to achieve. Um, and the ability to find a metaphor or uh, a symbol or some kind of image to connect to the other person. So it's not like writing a hallmark uh, card, one What's of these that, yeah. you buy off the shelf, yeah. yeah. Not not like that kind of, violets uh, um, are red, roses are red, violets are blue, and so on. It, it's very cliche. So it's the ability to find that connection to something that's not cliche. So one of the exercises, for example, I do with my creative writing students is, I get them to write like a mind map. Anything, everything associated with love. With love. Mm. So like head over heels, uh, fall in love, roses are red, etc., etc. So they created this whole mind map around love or what they associate with love. Then I tell them, strike up everything in that mind map. Don't use any of those metaphors, cliches, sayings associations and then you have to find a new way of talking about love without even mentioning any of these um, terms so it's, it's finding a way into love like a kind of side door without going through the obvious front door and that's what makes a good love poem i think i love it Love it being original, being yourself. And yes, it's being original, being that, yourself. Yeah, dropping all that that is contrived, that has been used, and rehashing it. And mm. uh, yeah, I love that. Uh, okay, so so uh, I want to move on to you mentioned about the strip club in Brisbane. I think Brisbane is traditionally not known for their strip clubs. Like it's quite a laid back, quiet uh, city. So. So yeah, why Brisbane? Now, tell me about <laughs> well, more about this experience. Well, I went to Brisbane back in 2001 because I was pursuing my master's in creative writing at the University of Queensland. So I was there for 18 months. Um, then one afternoon, I remember, I, I, I was up to that point, quite a good old Catholic boy, never walk on the wrong side of, you know, of um, salaciousness, so straight and narrow. So one afternoon, I was walking around the city, and I happened to see this club in the center of the city, near Adelaide Street, called Showgirls, and it was open. So I walked down. It, it, it's something like a you have to walk down a flight of stairs into the dungeon, and it was there was no cover charge. Believe it or not, you can walk in free and just have to buy a drink, and that's it. And you will see these girls dancing on the stage, on a pole, revolving stage. So I was fascinated, and I just, uh, as any guy would, right? Any 
um, yeah. hot blooded uh, guy would just sit and watch. And I ordered my first uh, flat white there. And that was quite a turn on, of course, as any guy can tell you. But over weeks, every afternoon, I would be there for maybe a couple of hours. Over weeks there, I started um, doing my writing there as well. I would bring pieces of paper with a pen, order my flat white and watch the girls do a bit of writing. And I started getting to know a couple of the girls quite well. They would come to talk to me, ask me about how my day was. And I got to know one of them pretty well. Um, her stage name was Joanna. But her real name, of course, is Stacy. None of the girls use their real names, obviously, yeah. when they are working there. And I found out that she is, or she was, a university student. She was in her second year pursuing biochemistry. And we talk about studies, we talk about this and that, and we, we got to know each other as people rather than, you know, stripper and client. And soon enough, I started delving into the mind space of what being a stripper is. They, because they tell me their life stories. I will meet, for example, a um, single mom mm. who doesn't have enough to pay for her kid, for the fees and for lodging and so on. So she has to do this for a living. She doesn't want to go on the door too proud. So she... she takes it upon herself to do this. All kinds of uh, girls I met there. And I also noticed when they're in the club, when they're working, they take on a persona, yeah. a voice. They, they are not who they are outside. Some of them will even wear a hair extension in order not to be recognized by anybody they know. It would be quite embarrassing, right? to be dancing on the stage and then recognize one of your old schoolmates from way back. So I started assimilating how they took on a voice, took on a persona, took on a character when they're in the club. And I started writing dramatic monologues in the voices of other people. So up to that point, I've never written uh, poetry in this manner. It's always been my voice, my perspective, my point of view. But I yeah, found it quite creatively liberating to be writing as somebody else. It helps me to look at things from different perspectives. So in fact, I wrote a poem published in my third book, Broken by the Rain, in which I took on the voice of the stripper. This is what it sounds like. I have to get up there Get on with the act and not let my feelings show. Make a show of my body, its bloom and lay sexuality, and not let it characterize me. This skin that I wear as a job has nothing you have not seen before, but everything to hide. My name, my mask, severed nerves still throbbing as I open myself up. If I pause and don't think too hard, I can disappear between the breaths of beat and watch at a distance, safe enough not to weep, my body unzip. The grace of small movements to a still point somewhere in the quiet of my being. So that was written for Joanna slash Stacy. So I show her the poem and she was stunned. How the hell did you get inside my head? Oh, that's so nice. Uh, and that was the best compliment uh, a poet can ever yeah. hope to get. That I managed to assimilate her character, cross the gender boundary into her voice, into what it takes to be a stripper. So um, I've got into this mode of writing in other people's voices. So I then started channeling, like a method actor, channeling these voices to other kinds of characters as well. For example, I also wrote one in the voice of a, of a beaten wife. And I had to do some research, of course. Um, this is a very short piece. This is titled, I'll Make This Night Talk. Come any closer and I'll make this knife talk. Swear in your guts. Cut you up and make you dinner for the dogs, which is what you are and where you belong. 
You dare say you love me? Knuckles again at the ready. Do you know my small hours? The small steps I take to inch or damage off. Rosary holding down the tremor in my palms and watching summer children and their lengthening laughing shadows lashing at my heart. No, I'm no longer your wife. This is my voice now. I will not put it down. I will not be put down. I love it. Thank you. This is one thing um, reading poetry on a piece of paper or computer screen is another thing to see it perform because you get the you get the way it was meant to be read mm. by the poet themselves and also the emotions that it communicates. So thank you so much for doing that. It's really special. Thank you. Yeah, and I In really, fact, I really, yeah, I really got the sense that you got into the skin of Joanna, Stacy, and um, you, you need to have that kind of sensitivity, vulnerability, curiosity, and openness to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. And uh, the word that came up was exactly what you use: a uh, channeling. Mm. Yep, very much so. And I was quite gratified the beaten wife uh, poem when I read it at the Sydney Writers Festival. A woman came out to me afterwards and told me that she cried when she heard the poem because that was um, what she went through. And I was so moved and gratified that she came up to tell me that. Yeah, to, so for, to, yeah, to be able to have the words for, for, for who you are and what you stand for and not being able to articulate it, articulate it and being able to find it through another medium, I think that is really, really powerful and healing by itself. So that's wonderful what you're doing. Uh, okay, so we have a break and we'll be back after this break. Thank you. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, a Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicate podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my shoes. shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Hello, we're back. This is Eros Evolution, and I'm with Felix Chong, uh, famous, famous, famous author. Uh, no, la, don't say that. Don't make me cringe. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Come on. 22 books. You know how many people can beat you uh, on that. So that's felixchong.net. Uh, and um, so just now, uh, before the break, we talked about uh, all everything around writing. And uh, he read two poems to us, which were really powerful. Um, talked about his uh, research process, uh, being in a ship club in Brisbane and being inspired by that, uh, through that channeling and giving uh, these dancers a voice. So I want to ask um, the difference between stripping and uh, pole dancing, in your opinion. It's kind of gone mainstream. Um, so what do you think about the, the link between the two? I think um, in the 2000s, when I started going to a strip club, pole dancing was still seen as salacious, very um, non-mainstream, only dirty old men, you know, with nothing else better to do with their time will end up uh, at a strip club. But I think since the 2010s, there's been a move away from thinking of pole dancing as 
something that is uh, related to the sex industry. So it's been co-opted by the mainstream and the exercise part of the pole dancing has um, been used you know, by gyms and clubs as a way to encourage women to flaunt their sexuality, you know, get into better shape, get yourself twisted up there or there on the pole and still look good. Yeah, of course, it takes a lot, a lot of training and effort and exercise to, to get that right, a lot of core work. I think that um, it's a kind of mainstreaming of, I think, the sex industry to, to some extent. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. And also people see the expression of their sexuality, uh, body positivity, mm. and uh, also as a form of exercise. So many mm. reasons why someone might go into pole dancing. Uh, so I'm um, I'm really curious about. Uh, oh no, where where's my question? Just a moment. <laughs> okay, so um, you know you have a book sprawl sprawl. Uh, so it has some scenes on BDSM. So is this really like suitable for kids? Like, why do you have such um, scenes of BDSM in that book? Yeah, this is the one. Cool. Well, um, this is a graphic novel, which is written as a noir comic book, inspired very much by Sin City, Frank Miller's uh, Sin City, and of course the film that was adapted from the comic book. Now, the story revolves around a detective and he's trying to investigate the death of a minister who was supposed to have died 20 years ago by suicide. But lo and behold, his body was found in a crime scene all tied up bound in BDSM style. So the reason why I chose BDSM um, in the story as a, as a kind of side theme is primarily because of um, control. BDSM, as you know, is about control. Who is the master? Who is the submissive? So this minister who uh, was corrupt and had to kill himself, kill himself, 20 years ago, was really into BDSM because then he can uh, let himself go in his day-to-day -day life. He was a minister. He exercised a lot of control. But then in his alternate life, in his sex life, he rather let go of that control. So it was important, integral to the storytelling. I didn't put it there just for its own sake, for shock value, but primary, primarily to um, enhance my theme of um, how a city has to exercise some kind of control over um, a sprawl of a city, the cityscape. Otherwise, things will go up, out of control into chaos. Mm. So it, it's a necessary part of the book. Uh, you feel like it's suitable for your readers? Definitely not for children below 16. There's a little bit of blood and gore, not too much. But I hope that can, even for you know, teenagers who are 17, 18, maybe they can open up a conversation about BDSM, particularly uh, after Fifty Shades of Grey, which is another way that an underground movement has been co-opted by the mainstream. It became like a huge blockbuster film Lots of um, women wanted to see it because of the book, right? The trilogy. So, um, yeah, I hope that would encourage um, teenagers to talk more about bondage, whether it's necessary, whether it's part of the the sex act that they want to do. Great. Uh, so, how do you feel about like? Um you know, having these scenes in the book and do you think it will affect sales? You know, did you have to deal with uh, censorship? Well, I really had to deal with censorship in some form because the National Library, which usually stocks my books on the shelves, on the open shelves, refuses to, to put this book on the shelf. So you can only read it at the reference section. It's, it's oh, not available okay. on the open shelf. So there, yeah, there you go. Welcome to Singapore. Yes, yes, it's yes. Control, isn't it? It's about tightening control. Yeah, the, uh, this is one of the struggles that I have uh, 
yeah, being in Singapore. Anyway, I can go on and on. So I want to move on to move on to how um, you know you write not just poems. You uh, you also uh, write uh, short stories, uh, graphic novels. Just mentioned sprawl and also uh, the opera. I actually saw uh, yesterday night um, this twenty minute uh, operatic performance around COVID. <laughs> Mm. That was called so Banning Love, right? Yeah, so how is it like you do so many things and would you say like um, Jack of all trades, master of none or you're just like kind of like always pushing yourself to explore the next new thing? For me, writing, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a way to extend myself. So once I've kind of um, more or less familiar with a particular genre, I'd like to move on just to try something else. It's mm. it's not just, just about being um Jack of all trades, master of none. It's about Jack of all trades and also master of all. So I'm always trying to relearn the craft of writing. Like for example, I've done children's picture books. I've kind of know what it is about. Then I want to try something else. See if I can push the envelope just a bit more to see whether I'm capable of it. It's about relearning the craft of writing, pushing myself down the stairs just to see if I can climb up again. So it's also about being humble to the craft of writing, being humble in recognizing I do not know everything. I may have done poetry, but I do not know much about writing libretto for opera or writing about um, a, a graphic novel. So. With each journey, each uh, undertaking, I have to dive deep into that particular genre, understand the conventions, the kind of characters that are usually associated with that genre. And then I try to find a story, a medium to write out that uh, the, the narrative to see whether that's actually what I want to say. So with that uh, Panning Love, what I did was First, I found uh, a composer who was willing to work with me, Chen Chang Yi. Then I thought about what kind of story would be relevant in this day and age. So this was written back in 2020, just during the circuit breaker. And I came up with the idea of how this um, social distancing ambassador, you still see them walking around, right, in, in town, how She's very finicky about control, about um, imposing fines on people who don't follow the rules. But she comes against uh, the irony of her own mother being in a nursing home, dying, but she can't visit the mother for one last look because she herself uh, can't visit. That, that was the point when um, inmates at um, nursing homes cannot receive visitors for fear of... Um, being infected with COVID. So against the control, a lot of my stories about control, letting go of control, how do you navigate around control rules? Yeah, very much uh, the struggles that all of us have in Singapore, but I think not just uh, Singaporeans will identify with it. That's uh, this uh, struggle we have with life, with systems, with structures, with mm. governments, uh, culture, society, religion. Um, anyway, you know, like all of us. So you you actually have a COVID book as well, right? The it's like a comic book as well. Yep, this one. Uh, in the yeah. year of the virus. Yeah. So this yeah, was right. still written during the circuit breaker, um, back in twenty twenty, and I started writing. Um, the poems as a kind of response to. Um, my own feelings about being locked down. Um, so I found an illustrator who could turn the poems into comics, into artwork. We had a few chats over Zoom and eventually um, we managed to get this into the bookshop. Yeah, speaking of cats, um, you have a few books about your cat, right? Yes, um, this one. This was inspired by my cat. Yeah, so cute. Meow meow, yeah. Meow meow. She's not sleeping, so I can't really show you what no, she no. looks like. Don't disturb meow meow. This is the 
Si Ko. Uh. And we are in the process, my illustrators and I are in the process of coming out with the third book. I love it. I love it. Um, I, I, when I was doing research about you, I know that you publish uh, books with different publishers in Singapore. I'm not sure if there's a publisher you haven't worked with in Singapore. That I think that has a lot to do with um, your uh, public relations skills um, or social re relating skills. So that must uh, be a testament to how you interact with people, your students. So well done, you know, for navigating the system. Uh, I think my cat is calling me. You want to see her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi, everybody. We are with Felix Chong. And just to let you know, he's actually giving away 10 signed copies of his poetry collection called B-Sides and Side Slides. Oh, you yeah. went hiding. I couldn't catch you in time. Oh, that's fine. So you actually need to email Felix Cheong to uh, get your copy of that book. It's uh, felixc at singnet.com.sg. So this will only be for readers in Singapore. Uh, maybe if you beg Felix, he might uh, come to an arrangement about sending his book overseas. But um, do drop him a note. Check out his 22 books because I've as you can see so far, like he has probably something for everyone from cat lovers to comic books, uh, sorry, graphic novels to poems. So uh, really, really a prolific list of uh, publications. And he's also edited my book. <laughs> so I wrote this um, essay, uh, one essay into this book, Letter to My Mother. Those of you who know me following my work may know that um, my mom died of breast cancer. Um, coming to four years now, and she had a very long battle with breast cancer. Uh, so I was very honoured to be recommended to write an essay towards this book. Um, so yeah, what do you think of my essay, Felix, compared to the other people? It was, uh, it was quite moving. It was quite moving. And I like how um, you discuss about um, also taking care of your dad. So it's yeah. not just taking care of the, you know, cherishing the memory of the one who passed away, but also taking care and making sure that the one who's living, the living parents still is taken care of, not neglected. So I think I, I, I like that part of your, of, of your letter. Yeah. So this is a letter to my mother. It was published uh, last year and it's actually part of a series, a letter to my mother, to my father, to my um uh, partner is the latest one uh, that was released around valentine's day this year and um uh, so basically uh felix was the one who edited it and all all four of these uh, books in this collection uh is published by marshall cavendish so you can check it out uh on in all major bookstores and of course uh, available on amazon so uh, I want to ask this because, you know, we have to be very mindful of our reputation and towing the line in Singapore. So how do you think your slightly more uh, salacious uh, poetry affects your work as a children picture or a book author as well? I think I appeal to different niche audiences. So people who read my graphic novels may not necessarily be aware of other books that I've written. Let's say my children's picture books. And I kind of compartmentalize if I'm writing children's picture books. I try to keep that uh, content very much in that particular realm or that particular genre. So I don't, um, you know, introduce unintentionally things that are not meant to be in other books. But um, having said that, I don't think that people will find that just because I've written books with BDSM theme in my graphic novel, they will shun my children's picture book because the, the two don't really mix. The, the, the audiences are not the same. So I know who I'm targeting, who I want to appear to, and I make sure I follow that. Mm. And also you mentioned that um, uh, in one of the articles that I was reading about you that uh, it's actually harder doing children's uh, books because you have to really use simplistic languaging and also um, go into their heads of like what children were like. Yes, very much. So, in fact, I would say writing a children's book is 10 times harder than writing a book of short stories. Because first, you have to, as you say, uh, make sure the language is simple enough for them to understand. But then secondly, you have to make sure that the words 
um, follow the or uh, paired with the illustrations. So you have to work quite closely with the illustrator. And third, you have to write it short, sharp, and sweet, very succinct. Yeah. Mm. I love so, that. So yeah, yeah, go on. Sorry. So um, it takes a kind of skill to be able to pare the story down to its essentials and still be able to appeal to children. And children tend to be harder or harsher critics. If after two pages, they don't like your work, they just forget it. I'm not going to continue reading this. It's the same with my cat. Do you know I read to my cat every night? <laughs> she, she loves bedtime, bedtime stories. So every night around about nine o'clock, she would come into my room, into the bedroom and nudge me. Hey, time for reading. So I read to her. And she loves her own book. This one that I've written about her. Oh. She asked me to read this book to her. And if she gets bored, let's say I try something else. If she gets bored, she votes with her feet. She just walk away. So the same with children, they, they, will, they will get bored easily if within two pages, three pages, the story doesn't excite them or appeal to them. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so so I, I, I do have a question around uh, whether you, uh, you know, men mentor uh, independent writers. I know you teach for a living, but how about uh, people who would like to engage you as their mentor, coach, people listening to this, you know, from all around the world? Well, on and off, I do uh, mentor writers, beginning writers. Um, we can have a chat about it. We can have a conversation about um, the mentoring process. Over the past 10, 15 years, I've mentored quite a few young writers who are now published writers themselves. For example, uh, Melanie Lee, who is an accomplished uh, young adult writer. She's She was my mentee back in the... 2008, 2009, about the period. Yeah, so so I'm I'm glad that you are nurturing um, different voices. So, uh, of course, I'm very curious, like um, how you pay, but anyway, uh, how how you charge, but uh, uh, that's that's something that I think should take offline. Uh, I yeah. would be really honored, you know, if you would be my mentor as well. So, um, so I, I actually also came across another piece of nugget about uh, Singapore siu thai, which actually means less sugar. And uh, you actually have three uh, versions of it, uh, three um, in incarnations over the years. And uh, the first one was published in 2014. And it was really interesting that you said you actually put it out on Facebook for uh, comments from people. Uh, so from the lights, you know whether it works and it's a way for you to test stories. I think this is becoming the modern way of um, getting social acceptance and also like uh, feedback from um, people before you publish a book, right? Mm. So I was experimenting with uh, beta testing some of the stories. So Singapore Suta is this series. I think I have the book here. Yeah, here so, Yeah, so Suta actually means less sweet, okay? Sugar, uh, less sweet, like when you're uh, tea, yeah. Or tea. So I started writing these uh, short, short pieces they're called flash fiction as a way to get, um, um, to satirize life in Singapore. And mm -hmm. I posted some of these short, short pieces on Facebook. And when the story gets many likes, I know it works. When it doesn't, so I know mm, the story needs to be working. And they are usually humorous stories, kind of taking a satirical dig and life in Singapore, how funny we've become and how, you know, whether it's kiasu behavior, afraid to lose out, or our politics, our mannerisms. It's meant to be fun. Yeah, I love it. It's it's very um it's very uh local culture where people gather and uh start off their day with coffee and tea. And also your book launch was actually in a cafe. Yep, at uh, the toast box outlet and one one two katong. Yeah, if any of you ever visit Singapore, uh, do check out Toast Box in Singapore. <laughs> I don't think you ever really are a visitor of Singapore if you don't know or have visited one of our uh. Toast places. 
uh, where we serve uh, half boiled eggs. Half boiled, mm -hmm. raw eggs. Runny, yeah, the, eggs. Runny. yeah the runny eggs. Yes, half yes, boiled. yes. Yeah, half boiled. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that's how Singaporean I am. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, um, since uh, you know, uh, I'm a sexologist, and everything that I talk about and uh, work around is around sex. So of course, I'm very curious. Are you going to take a step? Um, at uh, writing uh, more books around sex and sexuality? Well, um, not at the moment. I think um, after writing that, that whole the poem about strippers, maybe that's it. Yeah, um, and that was like, what, more than 10 years ago? Come on, you have it <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I... Yes, mm, but how to find a story, interesting story around it? Mm. Maybe my next story could be around a sexologist. Okay, I'll be your subject. Uh, also, you can think about how how tough it is being a young person with all this hookup culture and being gaslighted, being uh, uh, being uh, a ghoster being stonewall mm. like all these toxic things that play out in modern day relationships and um maybe like turn it into anyway i think we're just brainstorming here yeah, yeah. We, we, i can um some of the stories in singapore's youth i also talk about um phenomena social media phenomenon like ghosting and catfishing yeah so this um subject that i've talked about before Yes, uh, and I while well, I was doing research uh, about you last night uh, because I really wanted to do you justice and do a good job uh, since you are such a prolific uh, author and also public figure in Singapore. Uh, I found out that actually you have a tattoo uh, yes, of a typewriter on your right arm. Oh my god! I'm not sure how to show it to you. <laughs> okay, it's um, a... um, yeah. It's all black though. It's literally like a black typewriter on uh, your right. Well, it, um, it does need some touch up because um, I did it back in 2008 um, at a low point in my life when I was on the brink of divorce and I was trying to write a poem for my son, to my son, explaining to him why I had to walk away. I sat in a cafe and started writing a few words and I cried. Mm. I was just sitting there crying and crying. So I wanted to stop writing altogether. But thereafter, I decided I was meant to be a writer. I was born to be a writer. So I needed a constant and physical reminder to keep writing, which is why I went to a tattoo artist near my house um, in Roxy Square. And I asked him to do a typewriter for me. And he was quite intrigued. He said he had never been asked to do a typewriter. So he started researching, Googling, and we found this old school typewriter that I said, yes, that looks good. And he did it in three hours for 300 bucks. So I okay. think it needs some kind of touching up. Yeah, it does look a bit black, but uh, and the details of the typewriter keys are not so defined anymore. So I think it needs some touching up. I love it. So is that your only tattoo? Yes, the one and only. Although yeah, I've had yeah. suggestions, very helpful suggestions, to get a word processor on my other arm, I said, nah, when is it now? Okay, so uh, earlier off uh, the show, uh, you talked about being married for 26 years and your son is uh, recently married, 22, am I right? Yeah, um, I've actually been divorced. So my first marriage didn't work out, so I got divorced in 2008 and I remarried in 2010. So I've been happily married now for 12 years. And my son for my first marriage, first marriage, he's now 26. And mm -hmm. recently he got married. Right. So I got it all mixed up. Yeah. So you are you are uh, you're gonna be hopefully a grandfather soon. Nah, that's a long time coming. Really? Okay, so I love that you said that the typewriter tattoo uh is a mark of your thread and is uh sounds like a commitment to yourself to 
the craft of writing. So uh, here's to uh, all the best for your writing career. And uh, I hope all of you listening to this show will enjoy it. So remember that uh, Felix is giving away 10 copies of uh, his book, uh, uh, B-Size and Back Slides. So mm -hmm. to get uh, this copy, you have to email him at uh, felixc at singnet.com.sg. And uh, um, I suggest that if any of you are interested in uh, Felix's work and also being mentored by him, do reach out to him. And uh, his website is felixcheong.net. So this has been Martha. Thank you so much, Felix, for being on the show. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I, I really loved it. And I've never done so much research on someone. <laughs> I, I just really wanted to do a good job. I, I couldn't even sleep last night. So thank you once again. And next week, we have Cindy Gallup, okay? Cindy, the founder of Make Love Not Porn TV, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so do check out uh, Cindy Gallup's uh, profile online and uh, you'll see Cindy Gallup next week. So thank you and bye.